Welcome back students to our Chemistry 1510 video notes. We're going to do chapter 4 today, uh, molecular and ionic equations. So in the last video we looked at how um, solubility uh, plays into things and how to predict if solubility, um, if something's going to be soluble or insoluble. And so now we're going to take that and we're start applying it to chemical reactions. So when we look at chemical reactions, we have drawn all of our chemical reactions so far as molecular equations. Here's what a molecular equation looks like. It has everything written as the compound that it exists as. So even though your molecular equation might contain an ionic compound, that's fine. We're still going to call it a molecular equation. Now let's see how this differs from the next one, which is an ionic equation. So in the molecular equation, everything's written as molecules, but when we want to transfer that to an ionic equation, we look at the states. So remember how we said that certain things were soluble in our last video? Well, when things are soluble in water, we call that aqueous or aqueous, and we abbreviate that with AQ uh, in parentheses. So that's one of our states, right? So solids is S, L is liquid, G is gas, and AQ means soluble in water or dissolved in water. So notice how here we have three components that are listed as AQ. When you have something that is ionic and it's listed as AQ, so if it's ionic and listed as AQ, then when you write the ionic equation, you break those into their ions. Because like we saw in the last video, that's exactly what happens. Those break up into their ions. So notice how sodium turns into Na+, hydroxide turns into OH-, here HCl is an acid. Acids will also turn into ions, so H turns into H+, plus, Cl turns into Cl-. minus. Then for the product side, the Na turns into Na+, plus, the Cl turns into Cl-. Minus. So you remember when we were doing nomenclature stuff, and in your nomenclature stuff we needed to know the charges? We still need to know those. Charges never go away. So keep those in the back of your mind. And if you don't know your polyatomic ion charges, now's a great time to review. So then let's look at how we're going to go from ionic to net ionic. So what we do when we go from ionic to net ionic is we look at both sides of the equation. So kind of focus in on this reaction arrow here. Everything to the left is um, something you consider as a set and everything over here you consider. And what I mean by that is once you find that reaction arrow, if you see an Na on one side of that arrow and an Na on the other side of that arrow, those guys cancel. And then see you have a chloride on one side and a chloride on the other side, those cancel. And what is left at the end turns into your net ionic equation. These things that we're canceling out, these are called spectator ions. Like how when you go to a sporting event, you're sitting in the stands, you're just watching, right? Here's you at the sporting event. You have a sign that says, yay, go whoever. And well, that was supposed to be a smiley face, that didn't work. Uh, and so you're just watching there, cheering them on, watching the real action happen, which is going on on the field. So your net ionic equation is showing the real action that's happening. So, let's do some practice. So down here, I have two examples that we can do. Um, and I think I'm going to do one, and I'm going to leave you to do the other. So for this first one, notice how there's these 
blanks out in front, that means this is not yet balanced. So let's take a moment to balance this. If we take a moment to balance this, remember that on either side of our reaction arrow, we need to have the same number of each of the elements. So do you see how here you have an NH4 and then as a subscript you have a 2 there? So that means you have two ammonias, whereas over here you only have one ammonia. And so let's put a 2 in front of this. I'm going to make my 2 look prettier. Um, so that we have the same number of ammonias. Now that 2 carries through. It's kind of like math class. It distributes to the ammonia and it distributes to the chlorine. So now we have two chlorines. So we look over here and would you look at that? We've got two chlorines on that side of the reaction already. Notice how we can go through and just double check. We got one sulfur, one sulfur, one calcium, one calcium, everything else is balanced. If you want to put the numerical value of one in front of these to make you feel happy, go for it. If it's blank, I'll assume it's a one. So let's look at how to write the ionic and net ionic. So if we start with the ionic, remember we're taking everything that is aqueous, which are those ones, and we're breaking it up into its components. Now, polyatomic ions stay together. So your NH4 stays as one component. And what's the charge on ammonium? Do you recall? Do you remember that it's 1 plus? If you don't, it's a great time to review those charges. So then let's talk about what this little 2 subscript does. That means we have two ammoniums. And when we write this in our ionic equation, that 2 is going to come out in front as a balancing coefficient. So the 4 stays where it is because that's part of the identity of ammonium. But the quantity subscripts, those come out in front as balancing coefficients. So the state on that is aqueous, dissolved in water. And so we're going to include the state. So now let's write the sulfur. So we're going to write the sulfur, and then we're also going to write the charge on the sulfur, which is a 2 minus. That's something that we can have from the periodic table, right? We know that everything in sulfur's family uh, forms a 2 minus charge. So then let's go to calcium chloride. Calcium has a 2 plus on it. So we're going to write Ca2 plus, and again, it's aqueous. Now see how you have a 2 subscript where that chlorine is? That 2 is saying you have two chloride ions. So if that subscript was present to balance the charge of the ions when you were making an ionic compound, then that subscript comes out as a balancing coefficient when we write our ionic compounds um, in our ionic equations. So again, this is aqueous. So then we write our reaction arrow. Calcium sulfide is a solid, so we don't break it up into its components because it does not dissolve in water. Right? It's going to stay as a hunk of solid calcium sulfide. Then finally, ammonium chloride. That too, remember, distributes to the ammonium and also to the chlorine. So the problem ends up being that sometimes it's really easy to lose some of those balancing coefficients. And so we're just going to do our best to keep track of them. So now let's cancel out the things that are on both sides. So if you want, you can just kind of mentally cancel them out. I'm going to cancel them out in a different color because this is the correct ionic equation. And in order to write the net ionic, I'm just going to go through and see what is on both sides of the equation that we can cancel. When you're canceling things, they have to have the same state, right? That matters. And then also they need to make sure that it's the same compound, right? It has to be the same ion. So let's see what else cancels. Chloride. So now what is left is our sulfur 2 minus plus our calcium 2 plus makes calcium sulfide. Solid. Beautiful. I love it.
All right, so I'll leave this one for you. Just kind of be aware it's a little bit of a different format than the ones that we've seen before because this is solid and that's gas. So you're not breaking those two up. So give that a try. And if you want to talk about it in class, we are certainly welcome to. So I think that that's, oh, no, it's not. Oh, I wanted to do acids and bases. All right. So we are going to talk about acids and bases briefly in this video as well. And so we're going to keep our acids and bases super simple. And so when we talk about acids and bases in Gen Chem 1, and you are going to super expand upon this in Gen Chem 2, um, our acids are going to be things with a hydrogen written in front, and they will have that sign of the aqueous, whereas our bases are going to be things that have hydroxide and are also uh, often aqueous. So when an acid and a base react with one another, they always form water. And then this we sometimes classify as a salt because to organic chemists, a salt is any ionic compound. And so when we talk about acids and bases in Gen Chem, what we want to do is recognize that when we see these in ionic equations, they are going to be written as ions. You are not going to be asked to classify what in a weak electrolyte is, which is also a weak acid in this class. You can really truly get away without knowing that. Although there are some weak acids um, that you will need to be able to memorize when you take Gen Chem 2. And so if you just know that um, acids you write as ions, you're going to be fine. Let's look at some common strong acids and bases before we end this video. So as we classify acids as strong and um, weak, we're going to focus only on the strong acids, and then we're only going to focus on the strong bases. So depending upon the textbook you use, there's either uh, six or seven strong acids. I went with six here. So here are the six strong acids that we will use. Um, Notice how they are HCl, HBr, HI, so all of the halogens. No HF, that's on purpose. HF is not a strong acid. And then over here, um, nitric acid is one that we're going to use in lab that you're going to see. It's what it does, and you're going to go, oh, yeah, that's scary, that's strong. And then sulfuric acid is another one that we commonly use in lab. We don't use this much, this one as much in lab. And then notice how your strong bases all have something in common. They all have that hydroxide ion. And so, again, you can probably get away without memorizing any of these. But I am supposed to show them to you so that you can feel more successful when you go to Gen Chem 2. So let's go ahead and end there for right now. We'll come back with one more video covering the types of chemical reactions. So this is Katoni signing out.